magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Presented as a public service by Standard Oil Company. is battered Budapest under the brutal Russian boot. Soviet tanks roam the streets amid the ruins they made as communist secret police hunt down heroic freedom fighters. Here for all the world to see is grim evidence of the brutality and savagery with which the red tanks blasted a defenseless people and their city. Two Budapest cameramen risked execution to make these pictures and smuggle them out of Hungary. 25,000 Hungarians are dead Budapest is ravaged, but the communist masters cannot crush a proud people. Defiantly, they chant, we shall be free. Refusing to live under Soviet tyranny, refugees stream into Austria. They flee with little more than the clothes on their backs. At journey's end, they can smile again. Border guards beckon the refugees on as they brave the quicksand of an icy quagmire. The Russians have blockaded highways and destroyed bridges in a desperate effort to halt the mass exodus. But in six weeks, 120,000 Hungarians slip out of their troubled homeland. A refugee shows how the communists are spraying the escape routes with machine guns. Even the bravest must weep at leaving the country where their ancestors have lived, worked and died for more than a thousand years. A flag marks the border as the flight to freedom goes on. Carrying his son on his back, a father struggles through the shoulder-high marsh grass. Traveling day and night in freezing cold, the refugees stumble, numb and dazed, onto Austrian soil. By cover of night, other Hungarians make their escape on a tree trunk spanning a 14-foot border canal. Eager hands reach out to pull each refugee to safety. An endless flow of displaced and homeless, fleeing the black night of Soviet terror. Austrian relief agencies provide transportation to 63 refugee camps, where the uprooted Hungarians are housed and fed. None are turned back despite crowded conditions. 1,300 refugees find asylum in Holland, one of 16 countries offering new homes to the latest victims of communist inhumanity. The free world, which suffered through Hungary's gallant struggle for freedom, opens its hearts to the homeless masses. More than 50,000 are moved from Austria to other European countries. Out of the tragedy of Hungary has come an international mercy mission that knows no boundaries and no limits. Daily in Vienna, trains wait to take the children of Soviet oppression to a new home and a new life. This train is bound for Switzerland, where officials ask only two questions, name and birth date. Yesterday's suffering is eased by the hope of tomorrow. At the American Embassy in Vienna, crowds wait in the streets for admission to the United States. President Eisenhower offers asylum to 21,000 and officials work around the clock to speed them on their way. The first plane load arrives at McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. Stepping out into the crisp air of America, the refugees have found the freedom for which their countrymen yearned and fought and died. Offers of homes and jobs, clothing and food await them. By January 1st, all 21,000 refugees will have reached the United States in the biggest air-sea mercy operation in our nation's history. Under the stars and stripes, these Hungarians can work and wait and hope for the day when Hungary will be free. The United Nations Emergency Force moves into the Suez Canal Zone to police the uneasy ceasefire in the Middle East. Parading through Port Said, 
the vanguard of a 5,000-man army from eight nations receives a rousing welcome. When communist agitators try to provoke the crowd, British troops are forced to clear the way. The demonstration is a prelude to Egyptian guerrilla attacks on evacuating Anglo-French forces. But as the UN troops continue into Port Said, they are hailed as a patrol for peace. With their arrival, work begins to clear the canal of sunken ships. Spearheading the salvage operations are skilled divers. Egypt, by sabotaging the waterway, has seriously disrupted the flow of oil upon which Western Europe's economic life depends. 80% of this oil comes from the Middle East, much of it passing through the blockaded canal. In Paris and throughout all Europe, the gas shortage recalls the fuel famine of World War II. Stations run dry despite patriotic extra shipments by American companies of half a million barrels of oil a day. Filling station owners voluntarily ration two and a half gallons to a customer until there is no more. For Europe, a bleak winter waits ahead. The ill-fated city of Pompeii, destroyed by an eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, continues to emerge from the shroud of lava that has been its pall for centuries. Careful digging has uncovered remarkably preserved landmarks of this favorite vacation city of ancient Rome. A citizen of Pompeii, caught by the surging lava on a day long ago, lies immortalized in stone. A city that knew the grandeur of Rome slowly emerges after 19 centuries from the ruins of Pompeii. Art has many forms of expression. For Professor Egidio Boschi of Genoa, Italy, art is painting on pinheads, a task so exacting it can only be done with the help of a magnifying glass. The artist's brush is a single hair and he straps his tiny palette on his left forefinger. When it comes to the intricate work on his infinitesimal painting, Professor Bosky must use a microscope. Landscapes are remarkably detailed. In eight years, the professor has completed just seven of these paintings on pinheads. Each is a creation of incredible patience, but it would take millions to fill a wall. Devout pilgrimage begins in the mountains of northern Spain. The solemn procession is escorting an aluminum statue of the Virgin Mary up the slopes of Montserrat. The pilgrim's task is to place the image on the strangely eroded summit of the holy mountain. A statue of Mary was found on Montserrat a thousand years ago. Legend says it had been brought to Spain by the Apostle Peter in 30 AD. Seasoned climbers must make the assault on the smooth, sheer sides near the top. Montserrat is revered, too, as the site of the castle of the Holy Grail. To the mountain folk, the 4,000-foot peak is an altar of faith. With the statue on his back, one man inches his way up the face, a slow and inspiring ascent. The party of climbers nears the end of the precarious mountain pilgrimage as, looking like ants, they make their final attack. They have scaled the crags of Montserrat. They have carried their hallowed offering to the very top of the sacred mountain. A new shrine is added to the history of Montserrat, a new legend for the people of the valleys far below. this animal in close-up, from his hide come your bags, belts, and shoes. Who is he? An American alligator, survivor of a species that flourished with the dinosaurs. Sharp teeth and a powerful jaw give him a fearsome appearance. But contrary to popular belief, alligators seldom attack except in self-defense. 
eight inches long when born, they grow one foot a year until reaching full size, around 12 feet. Alligators are lazy, even when prodded. Next, a flightless bird with sturdy legs for speed and protection. The cassowary, a pugnacious creature with his own protective helmet. Very fast and strong, he is a distant kin of the ostrich. The cassowary's inner toe is armed with a long, sharp claw that can be used as a weapon. Native to the Dutch East Indies, he's one of 3,000 inhabitants at New York's Bronx Park Zoo. Another with a foot-high horn on his forehead is this water-loving resident of tropical Africa and Asia. Do you recognize him? Rhinoceros, of course. A thick-skinned animal with little intelligence and a bad temper. Dull of sight, his hearing and scent are very sharp. He's a vegetarian, feeding on grass and twigs, and likes to prowl the swamps and forests at night. Among land animals, only the elephant is bigger than the rhinoceros. Here in close-up is the tallest animal in the world. With his hoofs, he can beat off even lions. His long, slender legs enable him to gallop over 30 miles an hour. He has a fantastically long neck, but no vocal cords, and so is speechless. Giraffe is right. An animal of many peculiarities, he has a long upper lip and an 18-inch tongue. Reaching almost 19 feet in height, the giraffe likes the wide open spaces. Since he must bend on his knees to feed on low plants, the shy giraffe prefers to munch on tasty foliage from a tall tree. And the patchwork pattern of his coat provides a perfect forest camouflage. Although no coward, here's a fellow who's had cold feet all his life. The penguin, the aristocrat of the Antarctic. Fashion conscious and formal suit of black and white, the precocious penguins are accustomed to making their own fun on the lonely polar ice caps. Empire penguins breed their young in Antarctica in coldest winter, holding the eggs between their feet to keep them from freezing. But they are most at home in water, where they are masters at swimming and diving. Their wings, useless for flying, become paddles, and their webbed feet are employed in steering and stopping. Living year-round on the coldest continent on the Earth, the playful penguins are among the happiest inhabitants of the animal kingdom. Shielded by the mountain's majesty, sheltered by the whispering pines, the Lehman Caverns of Nevada are a national monument underground. This obscure entrance is the gateway to a twilight world of timeless beauty. Within is a subterranean vault strewn with fantastic formations, etched by water and time a hundred million years in the past. Some nameless Indian tribe buried its dead here 2,000 years ago. No one came again until the 1870s, when a pioneer homesteader stumbled on the hidden entrance. Today, thousands of visitors explore these wonders. A bleeding heart of stone. The pebbled bed of what was once a prehistoric pool. A million and one designs carved by the patient work of water and frozen now forever. The lime-laden water dripping from the ceiling formed gracefully tapering stalactites. The stubby stalagmites rising like skyscrapers from the floor were built by falling water. The cypress swamp is a forest primeval, stark and lifeless, its trees tied to ceiling and floor. Each downward-growing stalactite and upward-growing stalagmite has been sculptured drop by drop at the rate of one one-hundredth of an inch every 50 years. When they meet, nature has completed a creation 
500,000 years in the making. The Gothic palace is typical of the underground chambers, which starting as mere cracks in the limestone, were transformed by water into great vaulted rooms. The cavern's passageways were once tiny fractures in the earth, but the seeping water eventually widened them, creating a labyrinth of corridors and tunnels. Nature's wonders are for ear as well as eye. This is the music hall with its clear-toned organ. Where for century on century a spell of silence lay, now carillonic chimes drift through the cavern's twisting trails to be heard and answered from some distant chamber. In sound and sight, a magic place. Drapes of marble woven by nature will hang through all eternity. Time is frozen as fast as these sculptures of stone. No sun rises here to mark each new day. A year, a hundred years, a thousand years, yes, a thousand times a thousand years, come and go unnoticed. Nature's handiwork is unhurried, unmatched in its magnificence and unending. Deep in the earth, the water continues its painstaking work, fashioning new mantles in marble for a national monument underground. The New York Public Library. Within its white marble walls is stored the sum of man's wisdom. Close to 50 centuries of human thinking and experience, almost all of recorded history, lies at hand in the library's nearly four million volumes, inscribed in 3,000 languages and dialects. Through the entrance to this palace of learning pass more than two million persons a year. It is the greatest and most used library in the world. Although primarily devoted to scholarly purposes, it is an indispensable research arm of government and industry in peace and war. Heir to the literary treasures of the past, the library offers them free to all. Priceless manuscripts dating back 700 years include a musical score by Ludwig van Beethoven. The extensive revisions which clutter the pages illustrate Beethoven's patient striving to perfect his music. This composition was completed in 1811. Awful event, President Lincoln shot by an assassin. And here for historians is the story of how it happened, written on the day after it happened. A Gutenberg Bible, more than 500 years old, symbolizes the new age of knowledge made possible by Johann Gutenberg's invention of the printing press. Upwards of 8,000 persons a day come to the New York Public Library. Each has a question. The answer is somewhere in the library's millions of books and manuscripts. The search begins. It starts in the catalog room, where some seven million index cards fill the row on row of drawers that line the walls. Books are listed in three ways, by author, subject, and title. Magazine articles are cataloged by subject. The drawers may be taken to tables so that call slips can be filled out for the books wanted. The card index is the key to the library's usefulness. Books that cannot be found are useless. Call slips when presented are dispatched by pneumatic tubes to the stacks where a library employee begins the search. One book out of nearly four million. It seems like looking for a needle in a haystack, but it really is not, for although the library has some 80 miles of shelves, Careful cataloging, like an electronic eye, directs the library worker straight to the desired book. 
Elevators transport the books to the main reading room. Riding the lift and passing from floor to floor, here is a look at the library's repository of knowledge. Seven floors of stacks recording man's aspirations and achievements in every field of human endeavor. Pages from the past and the present join together to hasten man's progress into the future. When requested books reach the main reading room, they are taken to the delivery desk. Each order has been numbered. A switch is thrown and the indicator flashes the number for the waiting reader. Seven minutes after submitting the call slip, he claims his book. Some 20,000 similar requests are handled in a week. Although the books are not allowed out of the main reading room, there is no time limit on their use. Nearly 800 persons can be seated in the reading room, which covers half an acre of floor space. Here, only half of the room is shown. Founded in 1848, the New York Public Library has carried out Daniel Webster's century-old observation. On the diffusion of education among the people rests the preservation and perpetuation of our free institutions. 